So good to be together, to worship together, and uh, thank you all for leading us already. And uh, I think my prayer almost every week, what's on my heart as we gather together, is that when you walk in those doors that you would sense the presence of the Lord, uh, because where he is lifted up and, and praised, where he is uh, adored, um, I think his spirit shows up in, in a special way. And so if you came in with a heavy heart, if you came in angry, if you came in frustrated, if you came in exhausted, if you came in in physical pain, uh, the Lord's invitation to all of us today, to each of us, is come. Come and rest. Take my yoke upon you. I am, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so I pray that you have already sensed that, that you, your heart, your mind is lighter, and that is nothing other than the presence of the Lord ministering to you. And so as we turn to his word once again today, uh, I believe that the same thing's gonna happen. Sometimes his word uh, challenges us, sometimes it encourages us, sometimes it kicks us in the pants when we need it, sometimes it instructs us, it always instructs us, uh, and gets us to align more fully with who he is and, and what he is asking of us. And I think that's what we're going to find today. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you always to bring your Bible with you. Second Peter chapter 1, go ahead and turn there. Uh, if you have your device, pull up your Bible on your phone or your iPad. Second Peter chapter 1, I want you to follow along with me because you need to see this for yourself. Well, as you're turning there, we're going to start at verse 5. Um, if I were to ask you, if we were sitting down over coffee or lunch and we were just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if I were to ask you, how does your heart and life look different today and look more like Jesus than it did last week? What would you say? You say, Matt, looking at, at, at what, how this week has played out, like I can say, I think I look more like Jesus in this way than I did last week. Like, Matt, that's too short a time. Give me a little more space. Okay, how about a month? How do you look more like Jesus today than you did last month? What part of your character or your temperament or, or how you go about your daily life, what part of you looks more like Jesus today than it did last month? Can I have a little more time? Okay, how about a year? Do you look more like Jesus on this side of 2020 than you did in 2019? Are there things about you that you can look back on and be like, wow, like the Lord has definitely grown me in some of these things. Man, can I have a decade? Can I get 10 years? Okay. How does your life look more like Jesus now than it did 10 years ago? Are you quicker to repent to the Lord and to others when you see areas of sin in your life, areas of your heart and your action that just don't line up with who God is and how he designed us to honor him? Are you more generous? Are you more hospitable? Are you more patient? Are you growing more and more in a desire for God's word? As you look back over some time, can you say, hey, I have definitely grown in these ways. God has definitely formed me more and more into the image of Jesus. And so that's what Peter's going to talk to us about a little bit today. Um, there have been a few times, we've been doing the New City Catechism now for over, over I don't know, seven, eight months. And it's just 52 things each week. And so the, there's no special formula to it. It's like we picked one and just have gone through them linearly. From one to 52, we're going through. So this week we're on 34. There have been a few Sundays where it's like, man, whatever that truth was, like 100% aligns with wherever we are in God's word for that day. And so as I was studying this passage, just these 11 verses or whatever for today, and as I read the catechism that was pre-assigned to today, I was like, oh my gosh, the catechism says in a nutshell what Peter's getting at in these 11 verses. So I want to throw it up again for you because uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. Since we are redeemed by grace alone, through Christ alone, must we still do good works and obey God's word? And the answer that we all said earlier was yes, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his spirit, so that our lives may show love and gratitude to God, so that we may be assured of our faith by the fruits, and so that by our godly behavior, Others may be one to Christ. If you leave here today and you totally forget what this message was about, it's in your email because the catechism is listed in the email each week. That is the synopsis. And so turn to verse 5 with me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. 
and we're going to go through this. Peter writes, for this very reason, if you weren't here last week or even if you were, you might be saying, what very reason? Like we're jumping in mid-thought. For this very reason, what's he talking about? What's he referring to? If you look up at verse three, he says that God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, God has saved us and given us everything that we need to grow and to live for him. His spirit has been placed inside of us. That is all that we need to be formed more into the image of Jesus. So that's what we covered last week. And so Peter is like, because of this, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort to supplement your faith. When you hear the word supplement, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Vitamins, yeah. You can tell I take lots of vitamins. <laughs> Donuts. Um, vitamins, when we think of supplements, we think of vitamins. And we take vitamins because we think that something might be lacking in our diet, right? And so we want to add to, we want to supplement the different foods that we're eating. Or maybe our body doesn't naturally produce some things that it should. And so we take these vitamins so that we can be healthier, Right? Well, what is meant by supplement here, the, the Greek has a little bit deeper meaning, same vein, but a little deeper. When you look it up, it means to make lavish provision or generous and costly cooperation. So he says, make every effort to supplement your faith. Okay, here's a little history lesson. Um, I read it in one source and then like three or four other sources said the same thing. So I was like, I better share this story. Um, the ancient Greeks, right, are known for their dramas and their plays. And they would be kind of these opulent things, these big theatrical productions at times. And so oftentimes a wealthy donor would help fund the productions along with the state and the, and the playwright and maybe the director. Everybody would be chipping in. But there would often be this singular wealthy donor that would go above and beyond to make sure the actors were paid and that the, they had money for the sets and the props and that it would just be over the top. And this donor would seek to outdo the other donors. And so the term for that donor is the term that Peter uses here in the Greek as he's writing this. And it has this sense of a generous and costly cooperation. That this guy would bring to these plays, he would go above and beyond to help make the thing happen, to help make the play as good as it could be. And so Peter says, for this reason, make every effort to supplement, to be a generous and costly cooperation with your faith. So just as uh, Jesus Christ generously emptied himself for me, it's the gospel, that in turn creates in me a heart that wants to, in a generous and costly way, cooperate with his work in me by faith. That's what we're gonna unpack and so you might be thinking like, man, Matt, this sounds like works. Like you, you tell us all the time that we aren't saved by our works, that Jesus doesn't love me if I do more right things than wrong things, that I don't get into heaven because I've done all these right things or I've prayed this magical prayer. Jesus doesn't love me and let me in heaven because of my works. But it sounds like you're saying, do all this extra stuff. How does this work? Well, it's been said, and this is a quote you find around, that the gospel isn't opposed to effort, but to earning. The gospel isn't opposed to effort, but to earning. Over and over again, the scriptures make it clear that we had nothing to do with our salvation. Did you know that? You didn't wake up one day and say, you know what? I think I should follow Jesus, you know? I, I think that uh, it, it's time. No, the scriptures make it very clear that dead people can't bring themselves to life. You and I were dead in our trespasses and sins. And then back in the summer, we went through the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians starts out in verse 4 saying that he chose us to be his, to, to be in his family in eternity past before he created anything. He had already chosen those who would be his. And how many of you know you and I were passive in that? We didn't even exist yet. We can't even respond in faith until he regenerates us, until he puts his spirit in us and gives us the faith to do so. Your salvation, my salvation, had nothing to do with me or with you. 
It was purely an act of God's grace and love. Somebody say amen. If it was up to you to get saved, you would not be saved. If it was up to you to keep yourself saved, you would not keep yourself saved, neither would I. So while we were passive in God's choice of us, while we were passive in him saving us from hell, the Bible also makes it clear that after we are saved, we do have the responsibility to cooperate in his work in our lives. It's obedience and the Holy Spirit enables us to do this. Paul writes in Philippians 2, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so we aren't saved because of our good works. We are saved to do good works. We are to actively cooperate with the spirit of God at work in us. That's what Peter's getting at. And so what does that look like? Paul in Galatians 5, many of you are familiar with this. Maybe you grew up going to grandma's house and she had like a plaque on the wall that said this. Paul in Galatians 5 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. As Christians, as those who have placed their faith in Jesus, his Spirit lives inside of us. And as we walk with him, more and more the fruit, what should be coming up and out of our lives are these things. Our lives should be marked more and more by the fruit of the Spirit. And so Paul gives us this list, but Peter is about to give us a list of things that we should be growing in. It's not exhaustive, but it's illustrative of the fruit of the Spirit. What a life looks like that is being transformed by the power of God. And so look at the things he lists. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, Some translations say moral excellence, and it means that which fulfills its designated purpose. To live a virtuous life is to live a life that fulfills its designated purpose. When God created us, our purpose was to glorify him and enjoy him forever, as some have written many years ago. You and I were created to glorify God, to point to God, to make him more famous, to exhibit more and more of who he is. His grace, his love, his mercy, his kindness. We were created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That relationship with Jesus that we talked about last week. And so he says, add virtue, add living in to your purpose and how God designed you to be. So with virtue and with virtue, knowledge. Last week in verses two and three, we talked about how the word for knowledge there is a full, intimate, personal knowledge. When you are in a real relationship with somebody and you know them like nobody else, you don't just know facts about them, but you get them, you know them. That's the kind of relationship Christ invites us to have with him. But here he uses a different word for knowledge, which means a practical wisdom and discernment. As I'm growing in my faith, as I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord, uh, we should be able to see that I'm living with practical wisdom and discernment that aligns with the truth of God's word. That I'm not just making decisions based on my wants or whatever I think or whatever the culture says, but I'm growing in a knowledge that gives me wisdom according to God's truth. And so in knowledge with self-control, Some of you know that uh, Rome, which is where Peter is writing at this time, and the whole Roman Empire, it was not um, a place where self-control was really praised. Actually, the opposite was praised. It was go fulfill any passion and desire you have. You name it, you go after it. And that was seen as like a fullness of life, like go after whatever you want to do. We're not going to judge you. Live into your passions and your desires. And Peter here is calling us to a life that honors Christ, a life that is growing in faith, add to it self-control. A life that is not controlled by my desires and lusts and passions, but is controlled by the spirit of God in me that that causes me to, to walk with the Lord in such a way that honors him and doesn't feed the desires of my flesh. You still with me? So with virtue and knowledge and self-control, He says, with steadfastness. Steadfastness is the ability to endure difficult things. 
First Peter talked all about the suffering that we should expect for being followers of Jesus Christ. Stuff happens in life. The result of sin and brokenness in the world, it comes. And so as you are a young Christian, like stuff can come at you and be like, oh, God has forsaken me. He hates me. He must be unhappy with me. And Peter's saying, no, like grow in your faith so that the little things don't mess you up so much so that when you read something on Facebook, it doesn't send you into a tailspin of doubting what you know the word of God says to be true. These are things that we have to grow and you don't automatically get this huge, strong faith where it's like anybody and anything can happen and you don't lose it. Friends, I lose it when my car breaks down and I've been a Christian a long time, but the Lord is working in me a steadfastness that no matter what thing comes against me, he can give me that assurance that He's got me. He's got me in his hand. These are things we grow in by the grace of the Lord and the help of his Holy Spirit. And so along with steadfastness, he says steadfastness with godliness. Godliness is living rightly toward God and toward others, that my life is lived in such a way that it honors him and loves and honors other people. And then he says um, steadfastness with godliness in verse 7, and godliness with brotherly affection. What's he mean brotherly affection? It's a love for one another in the body of Christ. Remember when Jesus was sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper before he's gonna be crucified and he's praying for them? What's like the primary thing Jesus prays for them? He prays that they'll love one another. And not only does he pray that they'll love one another, in his prayer he's saying, I pray that your love for one another would really be the primary witness to the world the primary witness to those who don't know me and are not following me and haven't committed their lives to me, the way that they see you love each other with all of your differences and hangups and, and, and just craziness, the way that they see you love one another would be the greatest testimony to my power at work in you. Peter says, add to your faith. Invest in your faith. Brotherly affection. First John 4, it's gonna be on the screen. First John man goes after it. He talks a lot about the love of God and the love that we're supposed to have for one another. And he says, as anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. If the Lord isn't giving us more and more of a love for one another here, then maybe something isn't right here. And it doesn't mean that we're not gonna experience struggle with one another. It, isn't gonna, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have those things where it's like, I cannot stand that brother or sister in Christ. But what it is saying is that if the love of God isn't working in you over time and giving you a grace and a brotherly affection and a sisterly affection, then maybe something's not right with your heart before the Lord. Are these things being grown and cultivated in us? Are we investing in these things to see the Spirit grow this stuff in us? With brotherly affection, with love. You're like, okay, how is love different than brotherly affection? I just thought you said they're, they're both love. Well, the list started with faith. Add to your faith, supplement your faith. And then he lists all these other things. That, that faith is the prerequisite to growing these. You have to believe that God is who he says he is and that he's at work in you. And now we come to the ultimate fruit. And when you go through the scriptures, love always is held up. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. First Corinthians 13, if I can speak in the tongues of men and angels, if I can do all of this and do all of this, but have not love, it's nothing. And so once again here we see Peter is holding up like the end goal of this thing is love. And the love used here is a self-sacrificing love purely for the good of the other person. That I'm not loving you because there's something in it for me. I am loving you as Christ loved me, that he laid his life down, that he emptied himself. Even when I was his enemy opposing him, he still loved Add love. Verse eight. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, 
They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is awesome. He uses that word knowledge again, but he switches back to the meaning of verses two and three. He's not talking about now just having discernment and knowing right things about God and living it. He's saying, they keep you, if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or un, unfruitful in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you say that you are walking with the Lord, but you are not investing yourself to grow in these things in cooperation with the Spirit, you're unfruitful and ineffective. And people in your life, if you're not growing in these things, people may watch your life and be like, you look like everybody else in my life who doesn't know Jesus. I don't see any difference in you, Matt, than I do in my neighbor who is an atheist. Are we growing in these things? We can say that we love God and we know God, but if this isn't coming out of us over time, if you don't see that these things are being grown in you, then something may be off. Verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. You know what nearsighted means? It means you can't see far away. Well, which way is he looking? Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And so Peter's saying, if you don't see these fruits coming out of your life, then you've lost sight of the gospel. You've lost sight of what Christ has done for you, of what you have been set free from, of what you have been forgiven of. And I think we've also lost sight. We're nearsighted. We can't even see the hope that we have in Christ. We are just simply living for ourselves today with our focus on ourselves, and we are blind to what is really at stake eternally. Verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're like, dang, Matt, it sounds like you're saying again, and Peter's saying again, like, you gotta do this stuff or you're not gonna get into heaven. Like, be more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Calling and election is what we believe that where Christ chooses us, not because of anything we've done, but according to his will and to his pleasure. But it sounds like I gotta do this stuff to make sure I'm going to heaven. Um, we aren't confirming or solidifying our election and calling with God. That's a done deal. Peter's saying by living into these things and growing into these things, we are confirming in our own hearts that we belong to him. If we don't see this growth in our lives, if we don't have any desire to grow in these things, then that should be a warning sign to us that maybe our hearts aren't truly submitted to the Lord. Praying a prayer isn't proof that we belong to him. A heart that is truly changed will produce fruit and fruit over time. Almost done. Verse 12. Peter writes, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it is right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Told you last week that as Peter writes Second Peter, he knows he's going to be dead soon. These are kind of like the last words from a man on his deathbed. A man who is passionate that his brothers and sisters in Christ will keep going and keep pursuing the Lord. And so that last thing he says, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. That's so awesome. I think he's pointing to the fact that he's writing this letter. I'm going to do everything that I can to keep reminding you and encouraging you to keep going. I'm writing this down. And you know what scholars also believe? I told you last week that most likely Mark writes his gospel largely from the account of Peter. Peter discipled Mark. And so Peter had shared these stories and these interactions with the three years he had with Jesus. So Mark's writing down his gospel. It's highly likely that at this time, 
Peter is doing that on his deathbed. He is giving these stories to Mark, and Mark's writing down the, the gospel. Peter is saying, I will make every effort I can to remind you of the truth of the gospel so that you keep going and keep growing in the faith. And so three times in those verses, he says, remind, reminder, recall. But he tells the Christians then, he says, though you know them and are established in the truth, like you guys aren't flaky, like you, you love the Lord, you know the gospel, you know these things, but I'm reminding you anyway. Why is he reminding them? And why is he reminding us 2,000 years later? It's because we forget. We forget these things. And maybe you come in each Sunday and you're like, why do we always talk about God's grace and how he saved us and it's not because of our works? Why do we talk about these things all the time? It's because we forget. Because everything in culture around us is you got to get yours. You have to carve your own path. You got to make your own opportunities. You got to take advantage of everything you get. Live it up. Earn. And the gospel says it's been done for you. And you're free from all of that. And so the beauty of coming together at least once a week and singing the songs and praying the prayers and reciting the catechism and getting into God's word is to remind us of the truth and remind us of the gospel because it's the gospel that fuels this stuff, amen? You don't just go out trying to be a better person and trying to make wiser decisions and trying to be more loving. Peter, over and over again in the gospels, proved that you can't. In your own strength, you and I cannot live a life that glorifies Christ. It has to be his spirit at work within us. It has to be in cooperation with what he's doing. And the gospel reminds us of that. That I don't do good works to get saved. I do good works because he has saved me. It's a done deal. One of the resources I was reading says this. It says, the cultivation of godly virtue comes, according to Peter, as we remember the gospel cleansing of our sins. The gospel is not something we move past. It is something we remember and enjoy our whole lives long. It is grace that changes us from the inside out. We put so much effort on a daily basis. We put so much effort and time and energy and money into things that don't have a real eternal significance whether it be education or possessions or a job or kids' sports or a relationship or our physical appearance and health. I mean, Paul says to 1 Timothy, for while bodily training is of some value, that's great, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And so we put so much energy and even emotion and thought into all of these things that at the end of the day don't really matter for eternity in and of themselves. And while we devote ourselves to that, we often put our relationship with the Lord on autopilot. And we think, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I prayed the prayer. I go to church. I give some money might do a Bible study. And then that's kind of the extent of our engagement with these things. Are you with me? But I will spend so much other time on other things in like a concentrated, more intentional way and effort. And I just think my faith is just there and God's gonna do it and so I can go over here and spend my time doing this. And Peter in this passage, this is one of those passages, church, where he kicks you in the pants. He's like, yeah, Christ has saved you, but now you get the opportunity and the privilege and the calling to join him in his work in your heart and life. Not so that you can be a better person and more successful, though, so that you can be more and more conformed to the image of Christ because in the end, he gets more glory. And people will look at you and be like, oh my gosh, that person is a different person from the guy I knew last year. There is something different about him now than there was even last week. And God gets the glory for that. Are we being faithful stewards of all that God has given us to grow? He put his spirit inside of us, that's what he needs. In addition to his spirit in us, we have the written word, God's truth. We have it in, I, I don't even know how many Bibles I have in my house. We all have it on our phones. We have God's word 
accessible to us every moment of the day? Are we taking advantage of that and getting it into our heart and to our mind? We can pray with him at any time of the day. That's something the Lord really convicted me of over the last couple weeks, that I've just been neglecting just that ongoing conversation with the Lord in a focused way of sharing my heart with him, sharing the things that are weighing me down, sharing the things that are on my mind, sharing the things about other people that are on my mind, and just talking with him and carving out time in my day and not only dumping that stuff on him, he wants to hear it, but also listening and giving him space to speak to me and to take those things. Am I investing myself in those things? The other thing he's given us is relationships that we are called to know him and to know him together. That's not just a local church thing, that's a biblical thing. We are created in the image of God. He says, in our image, let's create them. Our God exists in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he created us to need him and to know him in the context of relationship. It's not just a me and Jesus thing. And so that is a huge reason why we have started up these groups these, this week. And this, don't worry, this message isn't to get us to this group thing. This is just one little piece. But we establish these groups as an outworking of that. Like we need each other. We need to grow in relationship. We need other people that know us and know what's going on in our lives and can push us and encourage us and draw us closer to the Lord. It's one of the ways that we grow. It's messy. It takes time. But it's the way he designed it for, to work. Are we making a generous and costly effort to cooperate with the Spirit's work in us? Are we making a generous and costly effort to cooperate with the Spirit's work in us? I'll end with this. One good test to answer that question. One good test is to ask ourselves the question we asked in the beginning. And if you're really brave, ask those closest to you. Have you seen me grow to look more like Jesus recently? Are you seeing these fruits, these virtues coming out of me in an increasing way? Friends, it's his work inside of us, but we have the privilege and responsibility to partner with him in that for his glory. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you for the reminder of these things today. And uh, Lord, of course, we want to be a gospel-centered church and a gospel-centered people, and we hold up, as we should every time we gather and throughout the week, what you have done, that we are only right before you because of what you have done, not what we do. But Lord, sometimes I think we overlook the things that you then call us to, that you have freed us from our sins so that. And so what we've talked about today are some of those so that's that we now have an active role to play in cooperating with your spirit as you form us more into your image. And so Jesus, we thank you for that. Lord, I ask that you would stir in each of us, Lord, beginning with me, a desire to want to do and to do what you have called us to. Lord, help us to make a generous and costly effort in our cooperation with you. We thank you for it, Lord. Would you continue to guide us? Would you continue to, to draw us to yourself? Because without your help, Lord, we won't do it. So Holy Spirit, would you stir in us? Remind us of these things, Lord. May we cooperate with you. In Jesus' name, amen.